My subjects this morning is what does the Lord require? And I have two texts. One of them is from Deuteronomy, chapter 10, uh, Deuteronomy 10, and verse 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for the good, for thy good. Then in Micah 6 and verse 8, the prophet says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. Now in this lesson, what I wish to do is to compile the answers given in those passages about what doth the Lord require. Now the first one of these was, what does the Lord require of Israel? They were the people of God, so what God required of them would be of interest to us. Now we mentioned this morning in the Bible lesson that those things written before were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Meaning that the Old Testament, even though we are not governed by its covenant, yet there are principles involved which are eternal principles and which are good for every age, including the Christian dispensation in which we live. Because they reveal to us the unchanging nature of God. And this especially would address that issue. In the passage in Micah, he's dealing more with the individual righteous person before God or saint before God uh, rather than just the nation as a whole. But even considering that it was written to the nation of Israel, the na uh, any country or a kingdom is the sum of its parts. And so in order for the kingdom itself, the kingdom of Israel in this case, to meet those particular guidelines of the Lord, then each individual would have to do his part. So it does boil down to the individual. What does God require of thee? And God does require. I think there's people who believe that we live in such a um, position of being free from restraint that surely our God in his, all of his love and grace doesn't require very much, if anything, of us. But I think we need to understand that we are creatures of God. He made us in his image. He sustains us in this life. We're here because he upholds us with the power of his hand. And therefore he has the right to require of us. And we must not remain ignorant of what the Lord requires of. That's why that we're going to study this lesson today. The things required are good things. The Lord never requires anything of us that is bad or evil. First John, or rather this is the passage in Micah. In the first John 5 and 3, it says his commands or his commandments are not grievous. That is what the Lord requires of us or commands of us is good. And it's not something that's grievous or something of which is bad. He doesn't require us to do bad things, but the requirements of him are good. Now, there are six or seven things here, depending on how you combine them, that are given in these two passages, and I want to enumerate them one at a time. Number one, what doth, God, what doth the Lord require of thee? He requires that we fear the Lord thy God, that we fear the Lord our God. Now, this fear of the Lord in a way, is a summation of the whole duty of man. The passage which was read in your hearing a moment ago had to do with the, what's fear God, keep his commandments, Well, this is the whole duty of man. That's a wise man summing up the thrust of his book, the book of Ecclesiastes. After everything's been considered, everything's been tried, all the ways of the world have been examined, then the... The conclusion is that it can be summed up in this nutshell. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. 
The problem is there is no fear of God in some. And that's a dangerous life to live. This is one of the reasons why all men were convicted under sin in Romans 3 and verse 18. He says there's no fear of God in them. And then he goes ahead to say, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in verse 23. Now this uh, passage in uh, Romans 3 and verse 18 is taken from the Psalm, 36th Psalm in verse 1, where he points out there that in some cases there's no fear of God in them. You see, the fear of God is a foundational concept of our lives which restrains us from just turning loose and giving in to all the lusts that we might have and all of the sinful things that the devil might tempt us to become engaged in. If you fear the Lord, it's going to stop you from doing things that are destructive to your soul and to the lives and souls of others. Now I realize, and I want to communicate this, that fear, as used in the scripture, often carries the idea of reverence. And that's important. In fact, it may be used in that way more ways than it's used in the kind of terroristic fear which a person ought to have from the prospects of punishment or retribution or as the scriptures put it, the wrath. And that's, that's even brought out in the, in the chapter in Romans we studied this morning. But in Hebrews 12 and verse 28, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Carries two ideas. The main one though is the reverence there. In Psalm 111, verse 9, we find in the King James Version of the Bible, the only place where the term reverend is used, that is, as a title. Holy and reverend is God's name, it says in that passage. How dare any man to take upon himself the title of reverend, a name which belongs only to God. Surely this is an example of humans exalting themselves above that which is written or which ought to be. Yet the term fear is also used in the scriptures in the term in the idea in regard of uh, righteous judgment of God or the exercise of sure punishment of which the Lord has promised to those that are disobedient and unbelieving. Again, in Hebrews 12 and 20, 28 was serving God and accepting to believe with reverence and godly fear. The next passage says, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, if that's not talking about the punishment of God, I don't know what other terms he could use. Because the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness in men, according to Romans 1, verses 16 and 17 and 18. So then the fear of the Lord thy God is one of the requirements that he places upon us. After all, we owe our very existence to him. Wouldn't he be here if he hadn't thought us up and created us and put us upon this good earth and having a period of probation to see whether we can become fit for heaven or not through his righteousness. Number two, what does the Lord require? He requires us to walk in the Lord's way. Now that's brought out in these passages. To walk, walking, I've got a whole lesson on this. I just preached, I think this was last Sunday, uh, on the Christian walk. And that the scriptures compare living the Christian life to a journey, walking a journey, putting one foot in front of the other, going toward a goal and holding out to the end to reach the goal. And uh, so when to say to walk in God's ways, it means to live life according to the Lord's principles in harmony with his nature. For example, one of the very basics of God's nature is that of holiness. And it tells us that without holiness on our living, no man shall see the Lord. In Isaiah 35 and verse 8, I'll read, And a an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring man, though f men, though fools, shall not err therein. 
whenever we walk according to the nature that he's revealed to us in the scriptures as best we humanly can, we still realize we're humans and he's deity and there's a difference there. But also in the scriptures, as we said, the Bible is the very word of God. In it, he reveals, first of all, himself to us, what his nature is, what his mind is. Second of all, he reveals to us what he wants us to be. That's his will for us, his, his will for us to do and to obey. Now, the uh, Micah, and I've, I've combined these two, one of Micah's statements is to walk humbly with thy God. But it's still the walk of life that he's talking about here, but he just emphasizes humility or humbleness. There is a need for man to humble himself before God. That's the idea that he puts himself in his place. That is, man puts himself in man's place where he belongs instead of trying to usurp God's place. In so many ways, the human has tried to usurp God's place, making his own religious laws, his own ways of salvation, in trying to uh, exercise undue power over his fellow man. In James 4 and verse 7, James says, Humble yourselves therefore in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Let him do the lifting, instead of our exalting ourselves in our own pride. And then in 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Essentially the same thing as James had said. It is a matter of a human person adjusting his attitude. We're familiar with that phrase where sometimes a student, for example, is, may be reprimanded and say he needs to adjust his attitude. I bet parents, some of them have told the children the very same thing. Well, this is an adjustment of our attitude before God, having the proper regard for what we are as humans, valuable souls in the eyes of God. At the same time, we are under God. Another way of putting it is to submit yourself to the Lord. James 4 and verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. It's the idea of give in to God, do it his way. In the words of the song, let him have his way with thee and not walk in one's own way. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. We need to pray God for discernment where we can tell the difference between the way that's the way of death and the way that's the way to life. Number three, what does the Lord require? Well, he requires us to love the Lord. Is that a hard command? Seems to be for some people. But to love the Lord is a command. To love is a command. Can you command love? People say, well, now love is something you either feel or you don't feel. You just can't help it. Well, that may be true of certain kinds of love. But I heard a brother mention in the class this morning about agape love. Agape love is a love that can be commanded because it's a love which is under the control of your will. You decide that you're going to work toward the well-being of the other person. And that's love, the agape love toward that other person. This is said to be in the scripture, that is to love the Lord as the highest command, the greatest command is given. In Mark 12 and verse 30, this first and great command, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. I chose Luke's rendering. Now, Matthew and Mark both have renderings too. Matthew and Luke have renderings. I chose Mark's rendering. On account of he uses four terms here in our love for our, our God. We love him because he first loved us. John tells us that in 1 John 4 and verse 19. In other words, when we realize the love that the Lord bestowed upon us in creating us, in redeeming us, in providing for us both temporal and spiritual blessings, it's out of his great love that he does this, then how can we help 
but love him back. And that's the, the deepest motive for our loving him back is because of the love that he has for us. And then love the Lord, loving the Lord is the foundation of our obedience. And I think it's important here to point out obedience. He speaks back in the Deuteronomy 10 and verse 13 about keeping his commandments. And we'll deal maybe just a little more of that. But I want to bring it in under serving the Lord. I'm going to bring it in here. Where Jesus said, who was the son of God, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then he says, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. John 14, verse 15, and also verse 23. So what more can we say about the... Um, requirement of the Lord to love the Lord with all of our being. And if we would do that, that would take care of a multitude of other things. Uh, for example, our words. We love the Lord. For, what, for example, we wouldn't take his name in vain if we really loved him. Um, it also would govern our actions. We'd, we would worship him. It wouldn't be a drudgery <laughs> to assemble with the saints on the first day of the week to worship him. But it would be a joy to be able to have the privilege of worshiping God and then treating our fellow man right, who's made in the image of God. We would, but that also comes under another point. So what does the Lord require? Well, number four, he requires that we serve him. Serve the Lord, he says. The fact is, we will serve something. That's just the nature of us as human creatures. We may serve ourselves. We may serve our own lusts, our own desires, our own pride, and so on. Or we may serve another man. Or we may, may serve, end up serving our, our possessions. Sometimes they become our gods. Whatever we serve becomes our god with a small g. But we will serve something. What we will serve is our choice. One of the ways the Lord created us is with the power of choice, and we're thankful for that. If we didn't have the power of choice, we wouldn't be any different than the animals who are governed by instinct. Joshua is an example of one who recognized the choices when he said in Joshua 24, verse 24, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. I want to get that first. Serve him in sincerity. And in truth, serve. And that's how we serve. That's how he wants us to serve him in sincerity and truth. Then he goes on to say, but if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now remember the Lord there is Jehovah. There, are all, there, there were many gods, but Jehovah was the only one true and living God. God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So, but he says, if it seem evil unto you or seem to you a bad thing. To serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He didn't leave them dangling about what his view was. I think it's a good, I, I get a side issue here. A gospel preacher and a teacher of a Bible class it's fine to throw out theories and uh, challenge the people in the class to make up their mind to decide which is right and which is wrong. And to challenge them to find in the Bible the right answer. But I still think before it's all said and done, before the subject is closed, that preacher or teacher needs to tell that audience what his conclusion is. Just like Joshua told him what his conclusion was. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then there was Jesus. In Matthew 4 and verse 10, in one of the temptations that the devil subjected him to, he said, well, the devil told him to I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus answered, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. We're talking about serving here. Serve the Lord. Him only. God is a jealous God. Jealous in a good sense. He will broach no rivals. Thou shalt have no other gods before me is what he told his people Israel. 
He's still telling us, us, telling us that today. Him only shalt thou serve. In Romans 6, and then Paul in Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? Here's the choices, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. And then he gives the conclusion, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which has delivered you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. He said, uh, we've made our choice. You and I, Paul says, have made our choice. We obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine and were made free from sin. To serve him means we follow him. We are followers of God. If we follow him, we're not running before him. I remember there was one of the old songs we used to sing, and run not before him, whatever be tied. And I thought on that, I'm not sure I really understood it when I first read it. I think I know what it means now. The idea of running before God is making your own laws and going your own religious way, regardless of what he has said, of substituting for him of adding to his word, thinking that one can improve on it. And that's a mistake. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants us to follow him, and that's to be his servants. Keep his commandments, as uh, Deuteronomy 10 and verse 13 says. And service to God is a reasonable service. In Romans 12 and verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable service. It's not beyond reason. But it's according to that which adds up to a logical conclusion. Number five, what does the Lord require? He requires us to do justly. Now, the first order of justice, and talking about justice, is that we need to be justified from sin before God. This is our relationship to God. God is the justifier. Jesus, of course, has been given all authority to effect this of those who believe in Jesus Christ. From, uh, we are justified from the gospel of Christ, being therefore justified by faith or by the faith, which is the gospel of Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5 and verse 1. The Lord does require obedience to the gospel in order to obtain this justification. Now, once we're just, we have justified our souls to have a good standing before God, then we need to turn to being just toward our fellow man. Treating our fellow man in a just way. That means we will be fair to them. It means that we will exercise self-control toward them. Not a just control of our temper, but a control of all of our relationship with our fellow man. It also means paying our debts, for example. I'm just using an example because there are so many things here I could bring forth. Romans 13, 7, render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. That has to do mostly with the taxes that we would owe the uh, civil authorities that we enjoy the services from. Need to pay our taxes. <coughs> Tax dodgers are not approved in the eyes of God. Christians will be most conscientious to pay every dime they owe. But there's nothing wrong with not paying a dime more than we owe to the civil authorities. And then fear to whom fear. Well, that brings us back to our first point of the lesson, doesn't it? Fear to whom fear. That belongs, first of all, to the Lord. But I think also he has in mind the civil authority when he says that. There needs to be a respect for the civil authority. People, Christians ought to be the most law-abiding citizens in the world and in our country. And then honor to whom honor. Then he goes ahead to say, owe no man anything but to love the brethren. Now, the idea here is to love one another. 
The idea is that you need to pay your debts. Don't go on owing. The idea there in the present tense means it doesn't mean you can't contract a debt, but it just means once you contract it, then you pay the debt. Um, a Christian is a person of his word. Whenever he contracts a debt, he's giving his word that he will pay it back in a timely manner and with whatever interest might be required in the agreement and that he will do that because of his integrity as a child of God. We keep our word, you see. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 5, the wise man pointed out there, better it is that thou shouldst not vow than that thou should vow and not pay. If you don't think you're going to be able to keep your word, don't give it. That's the idea there. Be careful how you give your word because you need to be a person of your word. And it seems like we've seen a decline in this in our generation. Generations past, the word was a man's bond, but it's just not so today and it ought to be. And it still is with Christians, faithful Christians. Number six, and I'm going to end it at six things here. What does the Lord require? He requires us to love mercy. Now, if one loves mercy, then that means he's going to be merciful. See, that's the point. Anyway, we love mercy in the sense that we receive mercy from God. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost, according to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. But if we expect mercy from the Lord, we're going to be merciful to each other. In Matthew 5 and verse 7, one of the Beatitudes was, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, as we said, we need mercy from God. And remember the publican who prayed in contrast to the Pharisee? His prayer to God was, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that was really all he said, because he knew he needed God's mercy. He was aware of it. He was keenly aware of it. Luke 18, verse 13, where you find that. The Pharisee was in contrast to that. We extend mercy to others if we're merciful. If we love mercy, we will extend mercy to others. Part of that extending mercy is that of being willing to forgive, standing willing to forgive. In, Mar in Matthew 6 and verse 14, For if ye forgive not men their trespasses, your heavenly Father, excuse me, that's the next verse. Let's get this verse first. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your trespasses. Verse 15. And I say stand ready for, to forgive because if a person persists in a sinful behavior, an evil behavior before God, you can't just say, well, I forgive you of it. Because what they need to do is repent of that. And what you need to do is try to get them to repent of that if at all possible rather than forgiving them. But you let them know at the same time you stand ready to forgive so that if they express the, uh, the godly sorrow, then they will be forgiven. Um, surely the Lord doesn't ask us to forgive what he doesn't forgive. <clears throat> and he says, if men do not repent, then they will not be forgiven. But at the, the opposite of that is usually what is the issue that is, of man repents and asks forgiveness, then if we continually hold it against him and not forgive him, then we'll be held accountable before God. And then <clears throat> have compassion on others. And, and again, I'm just using examples here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus is our example, our exemplar of compassion. In Matthew 9, verse 36, when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion upon them because they, were, they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep that had no shepherd. We need to exercise compassion on others. Is that a part of loving mercy? I believe it is. Have compassion on them in their downtrodden state, even in their sins. We don't condone the sins but can't you have compassion on one who has become so enslaved to sin that it's destroying him? Now, to this compassion, we don't enable him to continue. 
We don't encourage him in his sin. We try to rescue him. But we don't just ignore him. And that's where compassion comes in. That's where mercy comes in. In trying to rescue them. And some you just can't rescue. I recognize that. You just can't. And certainly we don't want to be their enablers. Where they can go on and sin and have us to support them and back them up in it. And that includes family. It's the hardest thing. It's for parents to have children that are wayward. And just can't seem to, to drag them out of it. And sometimes the parents become guilty of upholding them and enabling them to continue in the wayward way they're going. Now, that doesn't mean you just completely cut them off and treat them mean. But it means you show compassion and try to rescue them from their headlong plunge toward hell. Have patience with people. Patience with others. And refuse to take vengeance. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 19, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll start beginning there. Avenge not yourselves with wrath, but rather give place unto wrath. For the Lord has said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And then finally, on this particular point, on loving mercy, just a liberal application of the golden rule would have a lot to do with showing mercy and loving mercy. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Consider if you switch places and they were to, and you, what you would want them, the way you would want them to treat you and then be proactive and treat them that way. Many are looking for the minimum requirements to get to heaven. That is not the issue here. I don't know of any minimum requirements given in the scriptures in order for one to get to heaven because that, de that describes the wrong attitude to begin with. If that's the attitude we have, we probably won't get there. The attitude ought to be, how much can I do for the Lord out of my love for him, out of my determination to serve him, to follow him, and to obey his commandments, how much can I do in service to him and then humbly receive the crown of life and the reward in heaven. One final note. The Lord's requirements are not above our abilities. He doesn't require something of us that we just can't do. Anyone can do it <clears throat> if they will. If he wills to do it. My final question is will you do it? Are you willing to fear God and keep his commandments? If you're not a Christian are you willing enough to lay aside your sins and upon the confess your belief in Christ and be baptized into him for the remission of sins? That's how you get into Christ where salvation is. In this evening's lesson, I'll be back, uh, Lord willing. I'm going to deal with the Christian who sins before God. But if you're here this morning and you know as a Christian your life is amiss, then don't put it off till tonight by all means. Repent of your sins and acknowledge it and pray God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you.